Hello and welcome along to another RTE Rugby podcast. The season's flying by. Champions Cup pool stage is in the can. We're now into that little holding pattern up until the Six Nations next week. But there is still plenty for us to talk about. Uh, a mixed weekend for the provinces again in the Champions Cup. And I've got Johnny Murphy and Bernard Jackman to get through it all. Morning, fellas. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks. Only one place to start, Birch. And that's Becht have got their win against Sea Point last weekend <laughs> after you had to skip the monster match. Yeah, and it was tight. We got a last minute try, nineteen seventeen. So um still in the hunt with four games to go, but a Sea Point are are ahead. Um but yeah, we we've given ourselves a chance anyway. All Ireland Cup junior cups this week. So um yeah, so another another weekend. The club will be in the end of Six Nations, so all good. Yeah, the weekends are flying by. And Johnny, I was chatting to you beforehand before we started recording your NACE team. You also got back up and running at the weekend. Good win against the UCC and starting to, the league is starting to, to fraction off, I suppose, into the, the top six or the top seven and the and the bottom three. And you're you're hanging around in that top seven at the moment. Yeah, yeah. Similar enough to Birch, it was a big one for us this weekend when we were playing. So um, got that. And yeah, we're still in the hunt for that top four poor spot but as you say there's kind of Mary's are kind of gone I'd say one more win gets them kind of you know gets them over where they need to be to win it and then there's six teams for three spots so hopefully we can keep looking up and 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 see how we go this weekend yeah it's gonna be some scrap between now and uh between now and May for those spots we'll uh we'll get into it though we'll start out with the Investec Champions Cup and the last 16 lineup is now complete Leinster will host the Leicester Tigers in Dublin uh, we're not sure yet if it's going to be RDS or Viva Stadium. Munster away to Northampton Saints. Then you've also got Toulouse against Racing 92, Harlequins against Glasgow Warriors, Stormers against La Rochelle, Bordeaux Begla against Saracens, Exeter hosting Bath, and Bulls against Lyon. Those are the uh, last 16 games played on the, the weekend of the Friday, the 5th of April to Sunday, the 7th. We will start though with Home and Park, guys. Munster 23, Northampton 26. And just this incredibly inconsistent monster season is continuing 2010 up early in the second half having just scored their third try against a Northampton team who were briefly down to 13 players then 14 uh, the red card for uh, the red card for Curtis Langdon late in the first half if you're talking about monster being set up in an ideal position to just kick on and tag on a winning bonus point and see out a comfortable enough victory, that should have been it, Birch. But are we now entering a, a really worrying pattern with Munster where there's enough there's enough evidence this season where it's becoming it's becoming apparent that they are they are a team that just struggles flat out to play in bad weather. Yeah, they definitely they definitely struggle in bad weather. I think they're they're lacking that punch that they had in the past and probably aren't set up in the way previous Munster teams were to play the percentages um and and grind teams down so they look it's 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 an evolution of how they play and when it when it works you know we love it it's very pleasing on the eye but certainly um and it's not just their fault it's not they might not have much choice in it they don't have those that tight five that they had in the past who, who are dominant or whether that's a personnel or a coaching issue um, I'm not sure whether it's just a change of philosophy, but there has been a shift. Um, so there's two things. One, they they don't really play well in bad weather, and then two, for whatever reason, they're finishing games incredibly poorly, and you know, um, they're not, um, they're not always in the same games. There's been there's been reasonable weather where they just have 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 taken a foot off the pedal or or lacked lacked the ability to take control. So lots of Issues for them, I think they're probably the too long game. You look at it; it was a great performance, but as an overall for four European group games in not the hardest group, and only to get one win, um, is a is a very poor return for for Munster. Um, particularly a, a Munster team who had won silverware and he expected a bit more from this year. And I know they were riddled with injuries, particularly over Christmas, but they actually, you know, the, the Bayonne game at home. You know, they weren't as badly set injury wise in that game as as they became. And uh when you look at when you look at the group overall, that's probably one of the most disappointing results they've had in a long time. And that's the mad thing with it, Johnny, as well, where they finished this pool stage with one win, one draw and and two defeats. When if you look back across all four of those games, they were in a position where realistic like it it's it's perfectly reasonable to suggest that they could and should 
have been one of the top four or five seeds with a home last 16 game based on the position they were in in those in all four of those matches where they were in not just winning positions, but pretty good winning positions uh, midway through the second half. Yeah, I think the Bayon one at home in particular, um, you know, will, will has come back to haunt them. Um, uh, yeah, and, and I also like, you look at where they were in Exeter. Um, now Exeter are a good side. And also people are forgetting like Northampton are a very, very good team and they really were on it this weekend. You know, Sam Besty, um, he's an excellent coach. Um, so like it's, it really is, um, you know, this weekend, I'll be as disappointing as it was for them. They're playing a very good side who could be contenders going forward with, with what they have. Um, but yeah, they just struggled to, you look at what the halfbacks did for Northampton, how they control the game in the second half playing with the conditions. It was just a struggle. And I don't know whether it's the changing of kind of personnel or the changing of the, kind of style that they just struggle with with that kind of because they're set up to play a lot more than previous teams that they're set up to you know to to close games out and not and realize okay well we're not going to play now we're just going to play the percentage kick it down there even look at the bat to lose game um you know they need a bat they need to get into the 22 they have a play where they set up and Finn Russell is clearly a 50-22 play. Finn Russell drops back and he gets that opportunity. Munster didn't really do that or they don't do that. And they just have to learn how to be able to play both sides sometime in terms of tempo, control. You can play with tempo, but it can be their own tempo too and they need to control the game a bit more. Birch, like when you're looking at Munster at the moment and particularly these games now where they've been in good winning positions and, and have let it slip... um. How much of the, the the inability to kind of see it out would, are you putting down to players not being able to adapt in the moment and just refine the game a little bit and maybe maybe hold back on doing certain things and, and just making the right decisions? Or how much of it then is maybe like a coaching thing where they're, they're, they're being told to kind of stick to stick to the plan we're doing here for 80 minutes and ultimately it'll it'll all come together? How much do the do the players on the pitch as such have to kind of take the responsibility in the moment and realise what is needed at given moments in the game? I actually feel sorry for him a little bit because I think once that red card happened and Munster got that that second try, to Peter Manny try, then quite early in the second half they get the, the third try. I think their mindset and the pressure being at home all becomes about getting the fourth. And unfortunately, there's... Um, there's a bit of a fallacy, and, and Johnny's mentioned on it, is that when you're chasing like a four try, that you have to just keep the ball in hand. And um, effectively, they would have taught with 14 men against them that if they could play multi phase game for long enough, the cracks would appear like it did for the, you know, they're down to 13 for the, for the P try, but effectively that they would create space and create line breaks and eventually get that four try through keeping the ball in hand. But the problem was their breakdown work and their um, proficiency at, at keeping the ball alive and offloads going to ground, etc. Just, just let them down, and it was easier for, for like I, I wouldn't blame Jack Crowley for this or or Craig Casey because from Finn Smith's point of view, he's just trying to hope that they're in a position going into the last ten minutes where they have a chance of a bonus point. Realistically, that was their mindset, and you know he kicked two long range penalties, he kicked a, a drop goal, and then he just went right. Like let's have a go here. Let's go to the corner. Um, but Munster were had a different a different mindset. I don't think I, I think if you're the Munster coaching staff, like you want to be brave. You want your players to go and chase it. Just the problem is their execution was was so poor. Um, and then then at the end you saw them like trying to run for all twenty two, which they had no real choice then at the end. It was too late. So I would be looking. I I wouldn't. I don't think the 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 coaching message or the player's idea of how to, to go and get that win and get that um that bonus point was wrong. It was just when it mattered against a decent opposition, probably not world beaters, but decent opposition who were resilient. Uh, Courtney Laws really stood up and, and, and had some big moments. Um, Munster's skill set and breakdown work let them down. And they find themselves in a situation where they lose the match. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. Which, if they had tried to... I, I think they could have won that game by just trying to close out the game. But I think the pressure they were under 
with a red card meant that they were obsessed about trying to get the bonus point and it backfired completely. Um so yeah, look there's lots of lots of things that they they probably just need to work on. But the problem is when you when you don't have a dominant type five, a dom- dominant pack, and you don't have you're they're probably going backwards. I think their their kick chase, their ability to win contestables in the air, etc., is nowhere near as good as it was back in the day. Um so when you don't have confidence in that as a way of getting the ball back, it's even harder to go do it, you know. So um I think that's probably that'll be the big thing for entry is to develop a couple more ways they can play. Um so that when one play isn't working, they can go to another. And I think at the moment the shift has been very much towards that ball in hand, which can work and particularly in good weather. But have they got a a different way of playing and and have they the cattle to, to do that? And will they have the, the players to do that next year? Um like will they have a better pack? Um that's the that's the challenge. Yeah, like on on that point, Johnny, of like, do they have the the cattle to do it? It it obviously doesn't help their cause when they keep losing second rows to injuries, where they've got themselves into a good position. Tom Ahern gets hurt. Gavin Coombs has to go back up into the second row. And while Gavin Coombs, it's it's nothing against it. Like as in he he works his socks off and does does a job in there. But you're you don't have the heft of a natural second row in there and you're also probably losing Coombs from some of the stuff he does really, really well as a number eight. And, you know, he's had to play, I off the top of my head, probably five, six games in the second row so far this season. Yeah, and I think people underestimate now, Birch will obviously know more than me, but for, even from a scrummaging perspective, what that does, like it's very different from a second row moving out and playing six where Ty Byrne plays six, but moving a back row into the second row can really affect your scrum and the power that you have, even though they're like physical athletes, but like the technicalities of it and you haven't, you know, you're not, it's not your natural position is, is, is very difficult. And as you say, you lose him then because, you know, the effort that he's exerting, even at scrum time, and he's not then able to get around the park as much. And it, 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 it is difficult. And that is something that um, they've had to deal with. Um and they're continuing to deal with that. They're just struggling with in those injury uh things. But I do still think that they can be smarter when the likes of that happens and um you know be able to control the game in a different way. Um, you know, and I think Birch has hit the nail in the head. Something that, you know, Andrew Conway, even from back from Felix Jones, you know, they the back three were kings of the air. You know, you look back to say even Exeter and the bouncing ball. I know it's a really difficult kick, but that wouldn't have happened, you know, two, three years ago where they were kings of the air. And I think that's something that they need to bring back in and they need to be really secure in that backfield. And then also from an attacking perspective, when you put up box kicks, being able to contest and win those battles is a huge momentum shift in that play and gives you go for it because the, the, uh, the, team that are you're kicking to they're all moving backwards you're all moving forward um but yeah like the second row uh problem is a is a real issue for them and and it's not going to be resolved quickly either unfortunately yeah um i i'm never mad on doing the like monday morning quarterback stuff of like you know should they have taken this option rather than this option but i am curious to get your thoughts on so it was just after Finn Smith hits the drop goal to pull it back to a four-point game. There's about 20 to 15 minutes left. I can't remember exactly. Uh, Craig Casey wins the jackal penalty and Jack Crowley takes the shot at goal and pushes it back out to a to a seven-point game. There was like a little bit of debate between us, the, the media that downstairs afterwards. Um, a few of us thought that was the right call. A few of us didn't. I was in the side that actually thought it was the, the right call to kick at the post and make it a seven point game rather than going for the corner. I would just be curious to think what what did you think at the time watching it? Yeah, I, I thought it wasn't any issue with kicking the points to be honest. I, yeah. I, um, uh, I don't think they have massive confidence in their lineup mall at the moment as well. You know, um, I think that that played into it but I think they just wanted to get out to seven um, so if, if Northampton got a breakaway try, they still had two points so I could see the, the logic in it. Yeah, I think yeah, I think it was essentially kind of more or less a knockout game. So, you know, you keep the scoreboard ticking over. 
Um, there's so much on, you know, if you can go three, six, nine, you know, they get another opportunity, they exit off that, they get another opportunity, they're 10 points up where they go to the corner, difficult conditions, you know, line out doesn't go to hand, they're under under massive pressure again. The the next step then is obviously it, it leads us to Northampton hosting Munster in the in the next round. And um I'd be cu- I I wonder what some Northampton fans think of it all, Birch, because after like such a it's a brilliant win for them, obviously, and it's a huge it could be a turning point in their season, like you know, getting a big win away from home like that. But uh I was looking back on what would have happened, who would have been going to where if Munster had held on and won that game. And if Northampton hadn't scored that winning try, Munster would have been away to the Bulls in the next round and Northampton would have been home against Glasgow. Now, the way it's worked out, it's probably gone back in Munster's favour that you know they don't have to go the whole way down to South Africa. For Northampton, a home game against Glasgow is probably a little bit a little bit easier on paper than a home game against Munster. Um it's it's just a strange quirk of the system, I think, isn't it? Yeah, look into the system is <laughs> is a bit bonkers, let's be honest. Um it's it's not ideal and you have so many rematches um in the other uh, teams that play each other already back again in the in the last sixteen and not that many of them were classics either, you know what I mean? Um that you want to see again. So it's it's a little bit weird. Look, I think from Munster's point of view, it's an easier game for Munster to go to Northampton than the Bulls. I think the Bulls uh, are on an unbelievable home um, home run and obviously altitude and travel and cost and everything. Um, but I think Northampton will still be happy. You know what I mean? Yeah. I think Northampton, psychologically, um, they will feel that that was a massive win for them and won't have really seen a huge amount of Munster's play Um to, to worry them I, I think Munster are better than that I think Munster are, are capable of pulling out a big performance um, and you know they did that in Toulon but yeah it's a it's a decent draw for, for Northampton the, being home is massive M- Munster or Glasgow for Northampton it's a it's a it's a attractive draw I think yeah um, the last bit on this and it kind of it's more around the Ireland stuff than, than Munster but Tom O'Hearn I mean Johnny talk about just completely luckless where he's he's getting a sniff into the Ireland squad as one of these training panellists and then he obviously suffers that injury on Saturday, the, the head injury from the red card incident. He's going to miss the the training camp in Portugal. Keen Prendergast called up. Great great news for Keen Prendergast and he's been playing really well all season but for for but for Tom O'Hearn who was, who was having that breakthrough season and was getting his his first real look at the at the Irish squad. I know he was there as a development player three or four years ago but this was his first real opportunity to to impress Andy Farrell, and he's desperately unlucky to miss it now. Yeah, it's gooding for him. He, um, I think he's been one of the standout players uh, for Munster all season long. Um, it's very much his breakthrough season. Um, he's been exceptional in the wider channels, um, which you know suits how Ireland are set up to you know holding that forward on the edge when he gets those one-on-ones, you know, his athleticism is, is amazing. And uh, yeah, it's absolutely gutting for him. Obviously an opportunity for Keane, who played very, very well. Um, and was probably unlucky to miss out on the squad himself. But um, yeah, from Tom's perspective, um, yeah, it's a cruel blow, but, you know, hopefully he'll, he'll mend up well and he'll get back in throughout the campaign. I'm sure you know, after there's going to be some bumps and lumps after their first um first game, which might give them an opportunity further down the line. Um, and might be someone that that they could look at potentially for that Italy game at home on the Sunday. But, um, yeah, just hopefully he's he he recovers well and and he will get back in. He's going to be, you know, with how he's performed this year. If he can keep keep layering on those performance, I think he could be a stalwart in the Irish team for 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 years to come. Yeah, fingers crossed he does get another look in during the Six Nations. We'll move on to we'll stay we'll stay on the defeats. Harlequins 47, Ulster 19. Um Birch, I was I was driving down to Limerick when this match was going on, so I was listening to it on the radio and you you hear the commentary of it. I saw the saw the final score afterwards. I missed the last few minutes on the on the radio commentary. Saw the final score and then you think it's bad and then you look back at the highlights and you see some of the Harlequins tries and the reality of how they scored those tries made that result look even worse. Yeah. 
That was only the highlights. Wait to see the lowlights. Yeah. Watch, the, watch the full game. Um, that game, like the narrative after the to-do's game was like, how can we compete with a team that good and that powerful and that big? Big and that's the way the game has gone. Um, if you don't have the power, you, you can't. You can't expect to to be at the same, the same level. Um, Harlequins aren't to lose. You know, um, Harlequins aren't the 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 big, powerful, scary team that um that that Dan you know spoke about after to lose. And and I think that worse that defeat was worse. I I I I felt, I felt the defeat to lose. Um was was too uh it was too convincing you know there, there there was too many points conceded, but they needed to get something in the week after and and Quinn's Quinn's effectively had secure qualification, hmm. um and it was an opportunity for Ulster to 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 show uh, show what they're about and and they failed miserably and it, it, was, it would have been a demoralizing uh, defeat and now the problem is they don't play again to what the twenty twenty eighth of February or you know um and that that defeat is just going to be in their stomach um, for the next while some of the players who will be key for them trying to turn around won't be there they'll be an Irish squad and and they've been through this before um, yeah it's it's really dark days and I, I don't blame it on the coaching staff I, I, collectively when you look at that monster, that Ulster team um, you know the Ulster team that went to Leinster and beat them was the most experienced Ulster team that ever were set down to Dublin so like Dan in fairness has, has done a a lot of hard work trying to blood players, trying to bring them through, trying to get them to the level where they can show what they're about and what they're putting out on the pitch so far this season. Take out Racing at home and Leinster away. I even thought the Connacht performance wasn't brilliant. But so two games this year, they've really kind of shown a bit of uh, a bit of bite and a, and a bit of pride in 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 what they're about. The rest of the games has been pretty mixed, to be fair, and some of them have been very poor. So, um. The next block is is massive for for Ulster, um, and in terms of where they want to be as a group, and uh, you can sense the dissatisfaction from the fans, and a lot of it's been, I suppose, um, thrown at the coaching staff. But I I think when you look at that team, that squad, and those individuals, they need to be better. They need to be better on a consistent basis, um, because what they've put together this season, as I said, bar two matches. And even though some of the results earlier on weren't bad, um, I don't think it's where Ulster should be as a as a province. So, yeah, um, big big block for them next to see see what kind of character they have. But when you have, Birch, like when you have that many individual errors and that many moments of players switching off, is that not a reflection on the coaching as well? Look, the problem is the problem is is a while ago Dan said the coach the train the training quality is very poor, right? So that's um, it's rare to hear a coach say that, and you can commend him for his honesty. Um, but if that is the case, um, well then there's an issue somewhere. There's an issue with players, there's an issue with coaches, or why is it poor? And then obviously the problem is it's transferring. You know, like I've been in teams we could train really badly and play really well, and and vice versa, or whatever. But um, the the coaching staff and the senior players need to be conscious of. Of what good training looks like, I need to be chasing that all the time. And unfortunately, you saw the individual errors at the weekend. They just looked like they weren't switched on. They weren't ready to be to play at that pace. And and I think Quinns are a decent side. I'm not knocking them at all. Um, but I don't think I think Ulster on their day can go toe to toe with them. You know, um, and it wasn't it wasn't even a contest. It was it was a one sided affair. Um, and yeah, and whoever's to blame it doesn't really matter. But um, they need to find a solution to it, or there will be changes. You know, there will be changes, and more, and it won't be all players. There'll be coaches gone, um, because I don't think the the, the board of Ulster, um, will allow this to continue. Um, and as I said, you know, there may be players. Last year there was a bit of turnover. Some, some kind of regular Ulster players were were, were weren't renewed. Um, and and again, there's always there's a risk that that'll be the case again for the players' point of view. But also from a coaching point of view, um, I think the Ulster board and Ulster fans will will want heads on a um, heads to roll. And as I said, that's not that's not good. Um, that's not good for anybody. Yeah, no, it's not. And and Johnny, like I know at the at the start of this Champions Cup campaign, we were pointing out, for example, that 
Ulster were probably a little bit unlucky with the way the draw went, where obviously everyone else in their pool got to play against Cardiff, and that was that, and uh, so it turned out to be. It was a five pointer for every for every one of those teams. But when you're Ulster and you've won one out of four games, and the three defeats you've had have been basically blowout defeats, you can't really look back on on that little bit of luck in the draw, where you know. You've you've essentially been wiped out in in three or four games. It's their worst European campaign since twenty sixteen seventeen. Like while it did go down to the last game, realistically they didn't come close to qualifying. No, and I think they have to accept kind of responsibility on that. That you can't be, you know, they can't control the draw, so they kind of have to get over that and get on with it. Um, there is something wrong. Any time we speak about it, they're very yo yo like. Good performance one week bad but you know like and they have they're lacking for any type of consistency um and there's something up um they have a block now uh, a couple of down weeks where they have to resolve that collectively coaches and and players um you know it's always worrying when you see players um you know going onto social media and thanking fans for staying around and poor performances and it's very it, it's, it, I wouldn't say it's a nice place to be, but they have to collectively figure what's out because they're a good side. They have very good players, um, but some of their best players and most experienced players that have a lot of caps for Ireland are making individual errors that you wouldn't expect from, um, you know, uh, younger guys coming into you'd expect more from younger academy guys playing their first second third games for 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 their province and that's just not good enough um and this was we said at the start of the season this was a year where Ulster had to stop being nearly men um and I don't know whether the pressure of that has has uh, has in terms of them as a collective they need some kind of reward for all the effort they've put in over the last while and they've been you know in around that quarter final semi final spot but never kicked on is that pressure in their own minds getting better of them but I don't know but they've a block now of two three weeks that they have to try and resolve whatever the issues out and if that's training standards that's on the players too the you know and more so on the players because you have to get in the right frame of mind that right I'm in I'm out we're we're on it today and pick those days, those big sessions, be it whether it's your Tuesday session or whatever. But you have to you have to perform on those days. And it's clear that from what's been said in the media and how the players are performed, they're they're just not not doing it. And it's very, very frustrating for for fans and for anyone that's following them in terms of how high and low they can be. Final point on on Ulster then for me, Johnny, from a, a winger's point of view. Um, how far how how far away has Jacob Stockdale removed himself from from that Ireland team for the Six Nations opener against France? Yeah, I think he's been struggling for 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 form for a while. Um, I think with James Lowe back and with his, um, you know, with the left foot angle that we spoke about a couple of weeks ago, that probably knocks him out anyway. But then his performance for it to be a conversation, um, in a selection meeting over the next two weeks around where he's at, I think he's very much outside of 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 contention. Um and yeah, he's it's all based on form and his form is not where it should be for someone like Jacob Stockdale and it hasn't been for for a sustained period of time now, unfortunately. Um he needs to get back to his basics. Um I think a big thing for anyone that struggles with form, um, you know, as the old saying, you know, form is temporary, class is permanent. He has to get get down to his basics, which is his backfield cover, um, you know, his tackling in the wider channels, um, you know, his kicking, um, those basic um actions and qualities you need in the backfield, he has to be be at a kind of ten out of ten execution level on them. And that will allow then his talent probably take over and give him an opportunity to get a one on one where he scores or that. But at the moment, his basics are not are not in anywhere where they they need to be from a backfield perspective or a back three player. Yeah, we'll we'll move on to the more positive stuff. We'll start we'll start talking about a couple of wins for Irish provinces now. Um, Leicester ten, Leinster twenty four at Welford Road last week. Leinster Birch they 
they get the number two seed from the pool stages. So that means if they're in the competition right up through to the semi-final, they'll have home advantage all the way through to there. Could potentially end up against La Rochelle in a quarterfinal as well. We'll wait and see on that one. But uh, the 24-10 win, bonus point came right at the end. They It wasn't the greatest performance they've put in in the last couple of years, but they always just looked to be... They looked capable of stepping up a gear if and when Leicester did the same. Is that the right way of putting it? Yeah, I think they're they're building nicely without being flashy. Um, Got themselves into a little bit of a hole, obviously being up behind, never panicked, just played their game, um, their new their new type of game, and you know end up getting the bonus point win at the end, um, which obviously they didn't need, but it gives them that second place, uh, gives them that home draw, um, and and finish. Behind, behind to lose, I think were top seeds, weren't they? So, um, yeah, they're in a good place without being flashy. Got ex- they've lost two games this year. Glasgow home round one without any other internationals, and then that Ulster game where I think they obviously got exploited a little bit in that kick space. Um, but they that that's that's no harm for them. They're going to be in. They're going to probably end up in the URC or sorry, end up being top seed the URC anyway. Um, uh, but yeah, got exposed in an area that. They have to learn how to defend. So, um, I think they're yeah they'd be pretty happy with with, with how they're shaping up. Still loads of work to do attack wise. Um, while we're talking about Munster being very one way one dimensional, Leinster have gone a little bit more conservative. But you feel that um, you feel as the weather improves, they can play, they can hurt teams with ball in hand. But they're getting a little bit meaner. Up front as well, and and obviously they got better players um than Munster do, so it's a bit easier there. But the shift is back towards how you how they're minding that four pack, how they're saving their energy for for key areas through through smart kicking game and and obviously a defense that can catch teams behind the gain line. So I think they're going okay. Yeah, and and Johnny, like, do you think they'll be better for us come April and May? Where in the past, like. Last year is an example where they just blitzed everyone in the pool stage and the and the year before that as well, where they didn't really have a tough game. Even though they were playing good teams, they ended up just, you know, absolutely plowing through them. Whereas this time around, aside from the Stad game last week, I know they won comfortably enough against Sale in round two, but it wasn't a great performance. Um this weekend just gone, Leicester gave them a, a good going, but ultimately Leinster just had too much for them. Do you think come April or May they might little might just be a little bit more battle hardened for us? Yeah, I think they're going to get better every week. Um, said it before, you know, with a new defensive system, um, you know they're they're going to learn every every game. Uh, I also think there's a conditioning aspect to this that you know from a conditioning perspective they've never had to kind of had so many repeated efforts and the amount of line speed that they're bringing consistently over and over again. Um, with that, that's gonna when you're more battle hardened, you're gonna have you know a better conditioning base to then when they get their turnovers from D, their transition attack, which is electric and always has been, that they have enough energy that they can then click in. And I think their attack is 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 always going to be there because they've got such high quality and they attack in such a positive and and fast way, but their D is going to get better and better every week. And then their conditioning is going to get higher and higher and higher. And every week they're going to get better and better. And I think by the knockout stages of both competitions, um, you know, in two, three months away, I think they're going to be very, very hard to beat. Um, You know, you look at the draw, obviously that La Rochelle rivalry is probably going to come back into it um, as they go down, but uh, go through. I think it's, um, I think, Every week now, every training week, they'll get better as a group, even though their internationals are way the standard of the other guys is going to raise up the more the more they get. I think week on week, they're just going to keep improving because uh, I don't think they've clicked yet. And, you know, Neon Bar has been very clear. It's going to take a certain amount of time. It's going to take a, a sustained period of time for them to really understand and and um, and have exactly and be doing exactly what he wants them to do. And that makes them very, very dangerous when it comes to the knockout stages. Last point on Leinster then. Joe McCarthy was player of the match again. And every every week, Birch, I feel we're actually talking about him. But why not? Let's do it again. He's a he's an informed player. What is, what is his role with Ireland? 
in the Six Nations coming up. Is he is he on the bench? Is he starting? If he's starting, who's dropping out? In what way is that forwards pack being being manufactured to make room for him? I think he starts against France. Um, purely looking at what France can can do. Miafu is out. Paul Williams has come back in. Antonio has done a U turn. Um, on on retirement, I think. And uh, I'm looking looking at the French pack, the power that they can bring. And I think we need to get him in there to try and counteract that. And maybe maybe he needs to play every game so we can actually start, um, you know, enforcing. Um, our power and strength on, on others as well but certainly for France I think he needs to start he's bang on form and probably his margin of progression is uh, is still massive you know he, he's still quite inexperienced really hmm. um, uh, and he's still going to get bigger and stronger so I would start him and then it's a case of whether you, you pair him up with James Ryan or, or Ty Byrne um, James is probably similar in terms of you know he, he he's very physical Without maybe without, without definitely not having the size that that Joe has, and then <clears throat> would it be a big call to leave out Ty Byrne, um, wouldn't it? So that that's the challenge. I would be looking to see. I'd be starting him tight at lock, and then pairing him up with. I wouldn't have any quibbles of, of either James or, or Ty, um, but yeah, I I'd be starting him against against France. Yeah, you think that I, a yeah go, makeup. go ahead, Johnny. Oh, sorry. Go, yeah, well, it does it does because I would have like I'd be very slow to pick an Irish pack with a tight burn in it, and and if he wasn't playing second row, I'd have no issue with him playing six. But Pete was captain, mm. unless they went Pete seven, which obviously they can do. Um, and then you've got a you've got a better line out. Um, and yeah, like as Josh hasn't been, in, he's been better the last couple of weeks, but he's been quite ish since the World Cup. Um. Uh, so yeah, that's that's potentially an option. And jo- just Johnny, probably probably your own thoughts be on on Joe McCarthy. Where do you think he should be? S- same question essentially to you: Is he starting or or is he on the bench? Uh, I think it comes down to selection of the back row and what they're going to look to do. Uh, he's definitely going to be involved. Um, do you have that power coming off the bench or away? Do you need it automatically straight away? Uh, in the thing, and then a two he's paired up with. Um, I actually think that um, you could have. I think with Birch, what I said with, with Pete potentially at seven, Doris at 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 eight, and Ty Byrne at six, with Van der Fleer and um, you know Van der Fleer coming off the bench with potentially Conan on the bench. You then move Ty into the second row when you swap out who you have. Might be a way they 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 could look at, but. Um, I'd be going along the side that you need the power there straight away, so he would start. But then it's how the back row is managed, and are you going to take them on at line out time? Last, you know, during the World Cup, our line out struggled a bit, so did they need more jumpers? If that's the case, then you can play, you know, Pete at seven and 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 Tyler get six, and you've you've four legitimate jumpers there in that. But yeah, it's um comes down to me for the makeup of the back row. Um, but I I would be starting him uh, and then rolling dice and having having Pete at seven. Yeah, a lot of interesting calls to be made. We'll be talking about him on our next podcast. That'll be next Wednesday. The Ireland team will be announced Wednesday morning because it's a Friday game next week. Um, last Champions Cup game, obviously. Then Connacht twenty seven, Bristol ten. Johnny and Connacht signing off it, like a disappointing and difficult Champions Cup campaign. Uh probably started terribly and ended up having to, to chase their tails a bit afterwards, but finished it off with a decent win into the challenge cup. Now as the fifth place team, they're going to be away to pow in the, in the last uh, 16 of that. They're one of the lower, one of the lower seeds in it. So they will be pretty much away from home as long as they're in it. What do you see as their, as their ceiling in this competition? Is it a competition that they can and will try to, to go and win or will they be kind of, putting their eggs in the URC basket for between now and the end of the season? I think it's a a competition they can go and win, um, but they need to make a decision on on kind of URC and how that's going. But I do think they can fight on both, both fronts, um, particularly if they have a good, um, you know, block while the internationals are away. 
Um, but I do think looking at it, I was sitting down on Sunday evening looking at it. I I think it's a competition that they can really have a go off, um, and potentially be real contenders in it. I know they're it's, it's a difficult draw for them in terms of they're away a lot of the time, but um, I think it's a competition that they're they have a chance chance of winning. Um, just on a I think uh, also just a big up to JJ Hanron fifty European Cup uh games this weekend. Um, I suppose he's travelled a, you know, he's been a traveller for a while in terms of going to Northampton and then to Claremont and back and then Gwent and thing. But it's great for JJ. He's a he's a super talent. Um, he's a great lad and delighted to see those pictures of him after the game with that, uh, your um, your C cap of of fifty firm. But yeah, again back to the question. I think it's a competition that they can really t- have a cut off and and be proper contenders in. What have you seen of Pau this season, Birch, out of curiosity? Yeah, very good. No, sorry, the, the pace of great stuff was top 14. Sam Whitelock uh, now as well, don't they? Yeah, Sam Whitelock's yeah. arrived. Um, uh, they have the 10 from Exeter. Um, Simmons. Simmons, yeah. Simmons has been really, really good for them. Um, some good young French talent. About four or five years ago, they they started to target a lot of the good young talent in, in, in Pody 2, Espoirs, and paid transfer fees and just stocked up with, with good GIF players and, and starting to uh, come to fruition there. Conrad Smith was the high performance director um, and he was influential in that and trying to prepare them to get their academy producing local players but in the short term I suppose identifying high high, or high potential players outside of that and, and bring them to pole he started to bring them through so they are they are a challenge they are, they are a good side now um they're not going to win the top 14. Um, do they think that this is an opportunity for them? Obviously, they they haven't messed around too much in this competition um, to get a home draw. And they will be licking their lips at Connacht. You know, they will see that as a as a as a way into a quarter into the quarterfinals and um potentially win it. Uh, which for them it could be the next step uh, for them in terms of becoming a um you know a, a proper team who don't look every year and go are we going to survive you know at the moment they're still a little bit in that in that bracket even though they've started well they still probably the mindset of start of the year is survival first and then go from there uh, but this year obviously like someone Pelly and Leon have had really bad starts and uh, Paul have have, have, got, have got a bit of a run on them but um, winning a challenge cup for them or Connacht um, would, be, would be massive but I, I think that's a tough draw I think Paul are taking this competition seriously and um, uh, Connacht will need to be very good to beat the yeah, and I, I, I'm just looking at the bracket here in front of me there as well. So if, like, Powell was a tough game, if they get through that, they would be either away to Benetton or home against the Lions. And then if you get to a semi-final, you're playing one of Gloucester, Cast, Ospreys or Sale Shark. So it's by no means a, it's by no means a cakewalk to a, to a Challenge Cup final. Uh, Ulster, on the other hand, they're, they're, on, they're on the opposite side of the draw. They're away to Montpellier in the round of 16. Winner of that faces Claremont or Cheetahs. Last point on Connacht. The Finlay Bealham incident, or the Josh Caulfield incident, I suppose I'll call it, because he got the red card for the, the stamp on Finlay Bealham. Overturned after the disciplinary hearing yesterday. Just curious for your, for your thoughts on it. Um, I thought it was just such a difficult one to to figure out where... I'm absolutely certain it was a complete accident. And then on the other hand, I still kind of think it should have been a red card. I don't know. What do you think of it? I think it comes, it's like, um, uh, it's like a contact in an air uh, mm. where an accidental contact in the air can still lead to a red card. Uh, and that red card stands because um, you have a duty of care to the other person. Um I think it's a red card. I think it should stay as a red card. Accidental contacts are, are accident, yes, but you still have a duty of care to someone, particularly when it comes to your boot and standing on someone's head. Um, albeit an accident, fine, but the rules are the rules. Like, you know what I mean? Like, I think if it's a collision in the air that's accidental, someone lands on their back or their neck, it's an accidental contact, but it's still going to be a red card, um, and it's upheld. And I think that I think that that that's my opinion on it. 
Um, but yeah, it's a it is a tricky one to 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 look at when it is an accidental contact. But it all comes down to the duty of care the people are playing against. Yeah, I would be pretty much along that thinking as well, Johnny Birch. What was your what's your? I was on comms. I was on comms. Yeah, you were. I, I was watching the clip back mm, yesterday, and yeah, you, you were a, struggling to make sense of it as well. Yeah, obviously. I did. We didn't see it initially. It was only um uh beat him stayed down and then looked at us. It was just such an awkward, unnatural movement, isn't it? Uh, I, yeah, I, 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 my good feeling at the time was it's totally accidental. Um, uh, and I, I'm of the opinion that you shouldn't get a red card for something that's totally accidental. But I, I, I do, I do see that there has to be some kind of punishment for it, and and you know, um, because. But well, that could have been very serious for for the player. So you've got, the duty of care aspect uh, lets me uh, makes me think um, that yeah it can be read. But obviously the signing commissioners has has decided that it wasn't read, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. it was over. So I, and this is like man, I wouldn't like to be a TMO yeah. for love their money because they have uh, uh, like <laughs> a lot of those red cards aren't being upheld. Um, that's uh, across across the board on average. More more of them are being. Turned out or turfed out than actually upheld, and um, yet there's a massive emphasis on player safety. So, like, who's at fault here? And and it doesn't seem to be any joined up thinking. And that's like, I'm trying to make an excuse here, but as a commentator, I'm literally just crossing my fingers, like saying, I think it's red or yellow or whatever, because uh, I have no idea if it's backed up by the on field decision. And I also feel sorry for them. I, I think they're they're not sure because obviously for them, whoever's involved in that decision. If you if you're to believe the siding panel who have more time and more expertise or whatever, um, it seems that the referee got it wrong or uh, you know, so it's just it's just very very difficult uh, at the moment. Um, and obviously then we had the red card in in in, in Munster as well. So, um, yeah, it's a it's a tricky one. To, I wouldn't like to be a referee or team all. Yeah, I th- think that's a good point actually. Where you're saying you would want to be a team all for love and money, where. You know, people are listening to you give your thoughts mm. on the game doing mm. the TV commentary, but the TMO people are listening to his decision mm. process, you know, his thought process live in the moment. And while the transparency is brilliant for the TV viewers and the radio listeners who are able to to hear this conversation as it's going on, like we've seen the the controversy in soccer with VAR where they're trying to get those transcripts released and the audio released, where the transparency is great, but it puts some amount of pressure, Johnny, on the guy who actually has to make that decision in the moment. And not only does he have to make that decision, but every single person watching at home is listening to it happen. Yeah, it's not an easy decision for, uh, for him to make, but, you know, that's that's what his job is. So he has to be able to, um, you know, to make that decision and, and look at the information that he has um, there and then. But, like, I think they do need a bit more a bit more backup that when they make a decision that there's a bit of trust in the, in the process after. Um, and I think that's, that's a big kind of fall down by, um, in my opinion of the, uh, of the, you know, of the whole process that, you know, if there's a decision made, yes, they've more angles and all that, but I think there needs to be, um, a bit more streamline uh, on, on backing up of those decisions and backing up the referees on, on, on that. There are clear ones that everyone makes mistakes, everyone gets wrong. But I think when it comes to something like this and foul play and and that, that, you know, I think ultimately comes down to duty care of of your opposition players. Yeah, that's uh, we'll park it there for that. Anyway. Final point before we finish up, guys. There was a few other topics I wanted to touch on, but I'll just very quickly ask... Birch, the the Netflix Six Nations full contact is out as of this morning. Uh, I know you were on the radio talking about it last week. You've you've had a, a sneak peek at it. Worth the watch? Yeah, I think it's worth the watch. I think I think I think for people who've been close to it, probably lacks a bit of fight. But for for the new fan, it's very well produced. You know, and, that's the point uh, of it, though, isn't it? Like it's yeah, no, hundred percent. It's, it's for 100%. the. It's for the person who doesn't actually know that much about it. No, I, I, like, yeah. I think it's it's more than watchable. Like I, I enjoyed it. I watched it last week, um, and it's enjoyable. Is is it earth moving or no? It's not. They've, yeah. And this, I heard 
I had a really good interview with the with the the guy who made it, and and he, he also made obviously Drive to Survive and and Full Swing and things like that. But he said for Drive to Survive, it was season three before they got um got what they needed. Okay, sorry, where it kind of the trust level with the teams and yeah, uh, they kind of found out the their rhythm. Um, and then they had season five, which is obviously that season where Mercedes and Red Bull are going neck to neck. Um, and and that was their like their best one yet. So, and let's remember when this was filmed. Uh, and it was rushed in, you know. There was a little bit of mistrust from from teams. The Italians actually are probably the most open, and and that's yeah. often the way with the with the team that probably are struggling the most. Um, but I think it was it's more than adequate if you're new to the sport. Like I watch, like I, I watch all this stuff in sports. I don't care about just because yeah. um, it's there, and I know more about it now. And, and uh, so I, I I would like to think and believe that people who are casual. Ruby fans or non Ruby fans or sports fans will watch it and may be interested in the game. Yeah, and Johnny, like I think some of these documentaries, they or docu series, they get like they get a bit of a bad rap where I remember like when the Man City one came out a few years ago and people were talking about oh but you know we didn't get to see too much of the real insight behind it. And like the point is obviously that it's the the diehard football fan or the diehard rugby fan already knows this stuff anyway. Like I watch all of these series and the one I found most interesting was an ice hockey one about the Toronto Maple Leafs mm. because I don't really know that much about ice hockey and that's yeah. why I found it interesting <laughs> like, Yeah, and, and you look back at like even when you know, I suppose the original are the 30 for 30 ones you know and then yeah. the, also the ones on the you know following the American football in 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 pre-season like I wouldn't have a clue about that, but I watched all of those series and still do because you know the access that 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 you get. But again, the Harden, you know, you meet an American like as a diehard, he's like, oh yeah, they're okay, you know. But I think that's that's a, it's only a good thing. It's going to broaden the reach of the um, you know, of potential fans of the game, and hopefully it broadens our viewership, which is ultimately what we all want from a rugby perspective and. Hopefully, you know, if they do next year and it gets good traction, they might get more access and then they can build up uh, through that over the seasons. But yeah, hopefully it goes well. And I think we need to do more of this from a rugby perspective. It can be quite closed. And you look at what, um, you know, the following that, you know, someone like, you know, who Birch and I know very well, like Jim Hamilton, the following that he has and they have, and they do it differently. Jim and Goody, they do it differently. But people want that and I think the rugby fraternity has to open up to that side and professional sport and we say it from all the time even you know like horse racing you know Birch now with his new role like we're entertained that's we're, that's a doc that's a documentary I want to watch yeah yeah but we are <laughs> we are you know they are we're entertainment and we have to get in that if we want to compete in a crowded space of professional sport through TV rights, we have to have people watching it. And that's what it's all going to come down to. And um, I think that's a, that's a big, big thing. And there's a big opportunity now from a viewership rights, obviously with what Netflix have done with their new, um, you know, going into kind of the sports viewership Um you know, I think this is going to be, it's a huge opportunity and we have to do things differently and we have to be open to that and really kick on with it. Yeah, it's going to be really interesting to see it. I'm I'm getting straight off this call and I'm pitching someone on RT, the Bernard Jackman at the Olympics documentary. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, look, it, 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 the entire point is if you want a bit of light entertainment, watch Full Contact. If you want the the real nitty gritty rugby analysis. Birch, listen to the the RT rugby podcast. That's, that's that's the message, is it? Yeah, that's it. Summed up perfectly. <laughs> See that's, you guys. Go on. Listen, thanks a million. We'll call it a we'll call it a day here. We'll be back this day next week for our big Six Nations preview. The Ireland France team news will be out that morning, so we'll be coming to you live from Portugal for that one. We'll speak to you again soon. Peace.